Janelle, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. Janelle, tell us about the sort of person that you were before the events of September 11. What sort of things interested you? What sort of life you led? Oh, well, before the event of September 11, um, truly I was really a free-spirited person. I enjoyed the, the nightlife. My dreams were to become a dancer, uh, a singer, an actress, um, all the above of being in the spotlight. I, I was really an outgoing person, love partying, love the drinking, love meeting a lot of people, different people, didn't want it really to be um, confined to a steady relationship. So I was just all over the place in the fast lane, I would say, just living the life of Janelle Guzman and mm. just being inconsiderate about anything else. Those dreams took you from um, your birthplace in Trinidad to New York. Tell us about that, that process. Yes, I was born and raised in Trinidad and um, Trinidad is a very tropical, it's a tropical place, but it's very laid back. Not much you could accomplish in terms of the dream I was looking for. And um, I decided to move on and I wanted something better and bigger in my life. So I migrated uh, probably in the late years of in my 20 something years and um, I decided that I wanted this dream and America was the only place I could achieve it. Um, so I left Trinidad at that age um, with my daughter behind of course and mm -hmm. just being selfish again and just thinking about myself really. Your uh, upbringing in Trinidad was uh, was faith or, or going to church, was, was that part of, of what you grew up in? Well, I grew up in, a, in the Catholic um, church. Um, I went to Catholic school. My mom is a very Christian woman and um, she believed in the Bible. She believed in setting that godly um, example for us. And um, she has been instilling that in me from ever since. But um, I rejected it. I, I knew about it. I knew about God. I knew he was there, but um, I just choose not to live that life. Yeah. Regardless of what my mom said, you know, she used to tell me all the time that since I have this kid now, I gotta set on a godly example for this kid, and I gotta stop the party and stop the craziness, and you know, and just settle down and live a life pleasing to God. But mm -hmm. I totally rejected that. The the dream to travel to New York, uh, start spreading the news, etc., that that you were going to be a dancer, that this that you were in essence attempting to live the dream. Mm -hmm. Like so many before you, it didn't turn out that way, and instead of a dancer, you were an office worker. Um, tell us about, I, I suppose, the circumstances you're working in um, in New York. Yeah, that dream that I chased after leaving my daughter behind, come out to the U.S. to become that dancer, that singer. Um, unfortunately, I end up being a nanny, I end up doing babysitting. I end up um, working for a cable company, running cables in the coal and odd jobs and um, at night you know instead of trying to pursue my dream I would pursue the party life of yeah. hanging out and you know with the guys drinking doing all of the above and my dreams was just going going down the road and you know I didn't realize that and um, but I kept chasing that dream for some reason. Mm. I, I was a pretty good dancer and I really thought one day it was going to happen especially being in the US I really thought it was going to happen for me. But it never did. A office temp job uh, meant that you ended up working for the uh, the New York Port Authority, and of course, put you fatefully in the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th, 2001. Okay. That day, like well, for everybody else involved in that tragic incident, started like so many other days beforehand. I imagine. It was a normal day for me, just like everybody else. Uh, I got into work and, you know, head up to the 64th floor of that building. I just remember that day, just being there and talking with my coworkers and till that fateful moment that the building was shook and everything went bizarre afterwards. When did you first know that something was wrong that morning? Um, at first when the building shook, um, I thought it was an earthquake. Uh, and then I got up and I walked towards the window and I saw all the pa papers in the sky just flying around. Um, but the moment that I really realized that something bad has really happened is um, actually a couple minutes or hours after when I went into the conference room and actually saw the report in that it is a, a plane had hit the building and, and it's a possibly a terrorist attack. I was scared then. I knew my life was in danger because I'm on the 64th floor. 
and then the building shook again while being up there. And that's when my life just flashed right before me. I, I knew somehow I wasn't going to get out. For many people that day, caught up in that tragedy, they had conversations with loved ones and we've, we've heard transcripts and, and audio of, of the conversations they had with those who were close to them. Who did you phone on that day? First I phoned my boyfriend Roger at that time. I did get on to him. I spoke with him, told him I was leaving. And then um, I made a couple calls to my sister and my cousin and um, I spoke with them and told them what was happening. And then the last phone call that I made that day was back to Roger's phone, which I didn't get through to him that time. So I left him a voicemail, told him that I'm, I was gonna be, I'm gonna meet him outside as planned earlier and that I love him and um, I'm gonna see him soon. And that was the last phone call that I made. You were making your way down the building with some of your, your colleagues and co-workers and had descended to the the thirteenth floor when well literally the building collapsed around you. What were your thoughts at that time? When I made it to the thirteenth staircase, um I thought I was dreaming. I thought this actually is a dream. Um but just the presence of, of the dust, the the rubble, everything was just coming so loud, so hard. It knocked me to the floor. But when I tried to move and I realized that I was stuck, then I realized that the building did come down. It did actually collapse. I knew that no one was going to find me. And if, you know, the building just collapsed, I knew no one, no one was going to find me. So I just kind of shut my eyes and prepared myself to die. Literally 97 stories above you had collapsed around you. Um, you were in complete darkness. You were immobile. But yet somehow in this, this, this desperate, some people would say, hopeless situation, hope was something which started to rise with, within your spirit. Tell us, tell us about that process. Well, at first when it happened, um, I, I, there was no hope. I, I had no hope then. I, somehow I knew it was impossible for me to be alive, you know. And within time, just by knowing that I was still breathing, every time I closed my eyes and I opened my eyes, I realized that I'm still alive. I just started to, to focus on, and, and I started to pray. And with that in mind, before that came about, before the praying came about, is actually seeing my, my daughter's face in front of me, my whole life in fr just flashed right be before me. My mom, my family, my friends, everyone, I just, I just know I had to do something. There was something that I had to do, and that's when I started to pray and ask God for that second chance. Mm. Even trapped under the rubble, you were walking back towards God. Definitely, you know. Um, before I knew of God while growing up, but you know, I rejected that lifestyle. But being under there, it, it's like a light bulb went out, and in my heart, especially, I felt that burning sensation of wanted to change that way, wanted to set it right. I, I knew if I die, where would I go? You know, I knew where I was going because of the teaching that I grew up with. So I just constantly just started to talk to him just in a normal way and beg and plead with him and willing to do whatever it takes, not only because what actually, while I'm under there, what is happening to me, but I knew I meant it genuinely. I was willing to give everything up and start living that life. Would you say you came to faith? Oh, most okay. definitely. Um, being under the rubble, um, I definitely found God. I felt it. I felt it deep within my heart. I felt the change. I felt the transformation. I, I definitely accepted the Lord as my Savior, Jesus Christ, that day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at that moment when I was praying so hard and asking God to show me a sign, show me a miracle or somewhat, um, I felt that He answered my prayer that day. He did answer me. Now, you were buried under the rubble, I understand, for 27 hours, and yet just before you were rescued, you managed to, to push your arm up through the rubble above you and then remarkably felt somebody grab onto your hand. Tell us about that. Well, it's, this is really amazing to me as well. Um, just in that moment of praying and, and believing and having that faith strengthen me, I, I some, for some reason, I put my hands out there, my left hand, which was the only th hand I had loose, 
and um, I was begging God to show me a sign, or, you know, to save me. I couldn't take the pain no more in my legs, in my head. I was in so much pain. I was just asking God, please, just show me a sign. Just show me that you're there. Show me that you hear me. You're listening to me. And um, at that moment, someone grabbed my hand, called me by my name, and told me his name. He told me his name was Paul. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, Janelle, I got you. And when he grabbed my hand, I, I just squeezed his hand so tight. And I felt my body really calm, went really calm. And I just said to myself, thank God. And um, he just kept holding me and reassuring me that it's going to be fine and the rescue is going to come. And he kept reassuring me that I, just, I was just saying, thank God, thank God. Now, as it turned out, shortly after Paul grabbed your hand, you were, in fact, rescued by some of the volunteers who were working through the rubble. I understand the last person to be rescued alive from, from the rubble of the World Trade Center. Looking back though, and looking for this individual Paul, mm -hmm. I understand that, that after the fact, it, it became impossible to, to trace this individual and, and others say that it was impossible for him to have actually been there. How do you explain that? Yeah, um, that is a mystery to me as well. I mean. Um, after I'd been rescued, and um, I did meet some of the rescuer, which was Brian and Eric, and I've been searching for Paul high and low. I've been on the television asking about Paul. Honestly, it is a mystery to me. And um, with my faith being renewed and my whole life being renewed, and I start going to church and praying and you know talking with my pastor, and I just came to the conclusion that um, this guy Paul, does he really exist? Is he, is he that angel that I wrote about in, the, in, in my book? And um, I just realized that, you know, it's unbelievable that Paul would not come forward to say he was there. And that's the amazing part. That is the mystery that I, I think I may have to live with for the rest of my life. But I, I, Paul was there. He was holding my hand. I was awake through it all. And I know um, he was there. Mm. I felt his presence. I knew I was talking with someone. And that was Paul. The remarkable thing for yourself, of course, on the day after, you were saved from the rubble, but you also saved in a very different sense. Your life was, was transformed by what God did in your life that day. Oh yes, most definitely. Being saved from beneath that rubble and saved by God's grace, my life has changed. I had given my life to Jesus Christ that day. I've transformed into Janelle Guzman McMillan. Sometimes I don't really want to use Guzman because it reminds me of, um, you know, the old Janelle Guzman, but mm. because it's so sacred to my mom being Guzman, I, I carry the Guzman. The blessing has been so tremendous for me, and I've been walking and making, keeping my promises I kept to him under the rubble. I mean, I made promise to God that I was going to live his life according to his will, mm. and I've been 10 years, and I, I think I'm still on the right track doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm here today just to tell people um, that I am part of God's existence and let people know that God is real and He's out there and we just gotta believe in the power of prayer. It's a powerful thing. Mm. So much tragedy on that day, September the 11th, 2001. However, for you, in some ways, the best day of your life? Oh yeah, this is the best days of my life. Mm. Um, despite everything I've been through, um, this life is, uh, this is part of God's plans for me. And I'm forever grateful for that. And I am here today just to, um, to set that example to many others who might, you know, be living that life in fear. But I choose faith over fear. Mm -hmm. um, fear is not an option for me. I choose faith. And I just want to be able to tell my story and encourage people and to know that, you know, life is not guaranteed to any one of us that, you know, f Unfortunately, you know, it, it, I could have been gone, but I'm here for a reason, and I think there is a bigger plan and purpose for me. And I'm just staying focused and asking God, you know, you lead the way, you know, and I'll follow. And I'm willing to do whatever He wants me to do, genuinely, mm -hmm. I will. Janelle, thank you so much for sharing your remarkable story, and thanks for being part of the program. Thank you for having me. Thanks.